Hi, and welcome to Why Do Countries Exist, Episode 8, Argentina. So we've arrived at our first South American country, and our first federation with a country being made up of 23 provinces and one autonomous city that acts as its own province, Buenos Aires, which is also the capital of the country. Argentina is located at the southern tip of South America, with it bordering Chile to the west, Bolivia and Paraguay to the north, Brazil to the north and east, Uruguay to the east, and finally the Atlantic Ocean also to the east. The country is generally divided into three main climate zones. The north is hot and ranges from lots of rain in the east to little rain in the west. The center of the country is mostly made up of the Pampas region, which is largely flat and used as farmland. And finally in the south, there is the Patagonia region, which is largely arid and sparsely populated. The very southern tip of the country, on the island of Tierra del Fuego, is more temperate and colder. Argentina is also the first country where we have to talk about disputed territories. A disputed territory is very simply an area that is disputed between two countries. While there are some disputed territories with Brazil and Chile, the main ones I want to focus on are Antarctic Argentina and Islas Malvinas. A part of Antarctica is claimed by Argentina, with roughly 230 Argentinians living there, mainly doing scientific research, with no other country recognizing the claim. However, their claim on Islas Malvinas, or by its British name, the Falkland Islands, is more famous. The islands are currently controlled by the UK, with it holding on and off again control of the territory since 1765. Argentina, however, claims the islands were under Spanish rule since the 1490s, and that Argentina has inherited Spain's claim. Now, while the Falklands are small and mostly unimportant in any geopolitical sense, keep them in the back of your mind. Argentina population-wise is around 45 million people. Ethnically, it's complicated to differentiate, as most people in Argentina are a mix of European, African, Native American, and possibly some East Asian or Middle Eastern. Estimates suggest that racially around 96% of the population is white, 2.4% are Native American, 0.5% are Asian, and 0.4% are black. But looking at the genetics, the average Argentinian is believed to be 52-67% to 67 white, 27-31% to 31 native, and 4-9% to 9 black. I say all this mainly to say that Argentina is ethnically mixed, and assigning a label such as white, native, or black does not really capture the whole picture. It should be noted that roughly 64% of Argentinians have some form of Native American ancestor, and roughly 63% have some form of Italian ancestor. Language-wise, most Argentinians speak Spanish as the first language, with it being the language of education, business, and politics. Some popular secondary languages include English, Italian, Arabic, and a variety of indigenous languages. The indigenous languages of Guarani, Quechua, Huam, Mokovi, and Huichi are regional languages in some of the provinces, with it being given a protected role in these provinces. Interestingly enough, the Celtic language of Welsh is a regional language in the state of Chubut, with 5,000 people speaking the language. Religiously, most Argentinians are Christian, with Catholics making up 63% of the population, and Protestants making up another 10-15%. to Non-religious people make up around 19-25%, to with smaller religious groups such as Jews and Muslims making up around 1% each. So now finally, with the demographics out of the way, we can get to history. Argentina's indigenous peoples are roughly divided into three main groups, although every ethnic group has its own distinct culture and history. In the far south, there are hunter-gatherers such as the Hauch and Yanghan. In Patagonia's and the Pampas, there are most socially complex and populous hunter-gatherers, such as the Machupe and Pulche. Finally, in the north, there were agriculturalists, such as the Charue and Minue. These groups would largely be without any traditional political states until the arrival of Europeans in the 16th century. The first Europeans to arrive in South America would be the Spanish, who claimed all of Argentina under the Spanish crown. The Spanish would dominate the region, and while Native Americans would try to fight against Spanish encroachment, many would be killed due to Old World diseases, Spanish colonial troops, or be assimilated into Spanish colonial society. Quickly, a quasi-caste system with a variety of different racial categories emerged. Whites who were born in Spain, known as peninsulares, were at the top, while those of mixed white and native blood, known as the Creoles, formed the majority of the population and were seen as the middle class. Those of solely, or who look solely, of native blood were below them. And finally, blacks brought over from Africa to work as slaves in Argentina were at the bottom. Your lineage and racial group, or at least what you could pass as, determined what laws ruled over you and your place in society. Around 16 different variations of casta were formed in the Spanish-American colonies. While the caste system is confusing and arbitrary, just remember that if you're white and born in Spain, you were at the top of the social, political, economic order, and everyone else was below you. Spain would primarily settle in the north and the central Papas of Argentina. Buenos Aires would be formed in 1590 after a failed attempt in 1536, and grew to be an important port city in Spanish America, and Argentina grew to be an agricultural hub. At first, the colony was under the Viceroyalty of Peru, but in 1776 became the Viceroyalty of the Rio de la Plata, 
which gave Buenos Aires greater control over its own affairs. Buenos Aires became a trading hub, but was banned from trading with outside powers, such as the Portuguese or British, much to the annoyance of Buenos Aires merchants. Now we briefly have to talk about events going on outside Argentina to understand how Argentina gained its independence. The Atlantic revolutions in America, France, and Haiti towards the end of the 19th century showed to many people throughout the Western world that people could overthrow their traditional political systems and that colonies in America could become their own states. During the Napoleonic Wars of the early 19th century, Spain was invaded by France, forcing the Spanish king to abdicate. This threw all of Spanish America into uncertainty, with various independence movements springing out throughout the Spanish colonial realm. The British in 1806 hoped to take Buenos Aires and launched an invasion. However, they were beaten back by the Argentina population, with the Creoles making up the bulk of the military force that defeated the British. This showed to many of them that they didn't need the Peninsulares, and talk of taking power for themselves began to grow. On May 22, 1810, when the citizens of Buenos Aires found out that the Spanish provisional government was defeated back in Spain, they formed their own rival government in what became known as the May Revolution. They forced out the Spanish governor and established a new political order in Argentina. It is unclear if those that led the May Revolution wanted to break away from Spain, or if they simply wanted greater political rights for the colony, but regardless, fighting broke out between those loyal to the Spanish crown, known as Royalist, and those loyal to the Junta in Buenos Aires, or Patriots. The Patriots were able to drive out the Spanish from most of modern-day Argentina, although they lost control of Paraguay, Uruguay, and Bolivia. Eventually, in 1816, they declared independence, with the United Provinces of the Rio de la Plata being formed. They continued to fight Spain until 1821, after Argentinian general José de San Martín helped secure Chilean and Peruvian independence from Spain. Conflict didn't end in Argentina, however. Politically, the country was divided between two main forces, the Unitarians and the Federalists. The Unitarians believed in a strong centralized government based in Buenos Aires, where they had the most support and believed in broad liberal ideas. The Federalists believed that Argentina should be run under a weak federal government, where the provinces were given more power, and believed in broad conservative ideas. The very first conflict between the two groups would emerge with the Federalists overthrowing the Unitarian government in 1820. Civil war would rage on and off again for many years. After Argentina lost a war with Brazil in 1826, the Unitarians retook the government, although only a year later they would lose it again. In 1831, the Argentinian Confederation was proclaimed, with Argentina being run under a confederal system with no real head of state, although the governor of Buenos Aires would run foreign affairs, effectively making them the head of state. The confederation was de facto led by Juan Manuel de Rosos, who would serve as the governor of Buenos Aires from 1831 to 1852. Rosos would have to deal with a war in the north with a short-lived Peruvian-Bolivian state in 1836, a blockade from France in 1839, a civil war in Uruguay that Argentina would participate in, war with the Machupe people in the south, another blockade from France and Britain in 1845, and several revolts from Unitarians. Eventually, he would be overthrown by the governor of Entre Rios, Justo José de Orquiza, after Rojos declared war on Brazil. Orquiza tried to decrease the power Buenos Aires had, writing a new constitution that federalized the country, established a presidency, and ended slavery. This angered the Unitarians in Buenos Aires, who broke off from the Confederation and formed the state of Buenos Aires. The state and the Confederation would fight it out until Buenos Aires was victorious in the Battle of Pavón in 1861. Buenos Aires, led by Bartolomé Mitre, would use the 1953 constitution to end the Confederation, with Mitre becoming the first president of the new Argentinian Republic. Mitre would lead the country in a brutal war with Paraguay, that would result in 30,000 Argentinians dying, although Argentina would ultimately win the war, and the national treasury being depleted. Minor revolt would break out across the country until 1880, when the city of Buenos Aires was given its own status as a state. So now that the civil war is over, where does that leave us? Well, during this time, a set of political elites known as the Generation of 80 ran the country. This generation was dominated by conservatives under the National Autonomous Party, who carried out three important tasks. First, they used limited suffrage and electoral fraud, to ensure that they remained in power. Secondly, they expanded Argentina in the south and set its borders with its neighbors. And finally, they increased immigration to the country. Now, Europe at this time was experiencing turmoil as the Industrial Revolution industrialized much of Europe. Many looked for a place to escape to, and traditionally, we've been told that these immigrants traveled to America. But Argentina also received large numbers of them, with around 6.6 .6 million entering the country. Most immigrants came from either Italy or Spain, but many other ethnicities arrived, such as Ukrainians, Russians, French, Germans, and those Welsh we talked about in the beginning. One of the consequences of this massive immigration was the whitening of Argentina. Black Argentinians had been in decline since independence. They filled a disproportionate amount of the military, and because of that, they suffered the most during wartime. During the war with Paraguay, many thousands of blacks would die during the war, as their region was the most affected. This coincided with plagues that killed even more black Argentinians. The massive immigration into the country resulted in blacks making up a smaller and smaller amount of the Argentinian population. And while there are still black Argentinians, many have been absorbed and intermingling into wider Argentinian society. 
with black culture remaining an important part of the country. Argentina formalized its borders with its neighbors to the north, and with it, more Europeans arrived to find new land. But many Europeans decided that the southern parts of the country were good places to settle down. While the southern regions of the country were largely ungovernable by the Argentinian government, natives continued to live there in large numbers. From there, they raided Argentina land in the north, in what became known as the Milan Raids. While Argentinians had slowly been pushing south since independence, starting in the 1870s, this process dramatically intensified. The Argentinian military, more numerous and using advanced weapons from Europe, crushed most native resistance in Patagonia, and quickly the region fell into Argentinian lands. The conflict resulted in thousands of native deaths, along with the destruction of most indigenous ways of life in the region. The conquest of the desert still remains a controversial part of Argentinian history today, with revisionists, in particular the Machupe people, arguing that what happened constituted as a genocide against them, while apologists will describe it as a justified conflict against native bandits. A similar, although smaller, conflict against natives also took place in the Gran Chaco region in the north at this time. While at first the National Autonomous Party was able to rule Argentina with largely little civil opposition, this all changed in 1890. A liberal political group known as the Civic Union attempted to force out the National Autonomous Party in Buenos Aires, but would be crushed in what became known as the Revolution of the Park. The president at this time, Miguel Juarez Clamón, did step down to appease discontent in the country, but the structural corruption remained. This led to a branch of the Civic Union to form the new Radical Civic Union Party, or UCR. They would demand universal suffrage and the right to a secret ballot, along with general social liberal policies, and would stage another revolt in 1893 and 1905. Eventually, in 1914, the government would allow for a secret ballot and the suffrage for all men. This led to the UCR coming to power in the 1916 election, with Hippolito Yorigen coming to power. Yorigen would lead the country in what became known as the Radical Period, during this time, Yorijen would help establish progressive reforms in the country, such as the start of the social welfare state, and turn the country in a more progressive direction. While at first the UCR was popular with the people, by the late 20s the Great Depression led to the economy slowing down, and general discontent increased in the country. In 1930, a coup against the UCR government took place, leading to a right-wing military dictatorship taking charge. Before I talk about the new dictatorship that begins to run Argentina, I want to talk about Argentina's economy. Since the late 19th century, Argentina's economy has for the most part been doing great, Argentina was the second wealthiest country in the Americas, and had the seventh largest GDP per capita in the world by 1808, beating out countries like France, Canada, and Denmark. It had a large export-driven economy, with Argentina shipping out its raw natural resources and wheat to other parts of the world. However, Argentina wasn't industrializing as fast as the rest of the world, and remained largely rural. Education was also lagging behind, with many people not even having a high school level education. These factors, the Great Depression and the coup in 1930, all led to the economy of Argentina to stop rising, and the economy ever since has been in a state of flux. Some years the economy will grow massively, and just a couple years later it will collapse. Economists have many theories as to why it is, and I'll admit complex economic discussions scare me, so just know that for now, Argentina, from this point on, has a struggling economy. The coup of 1930 brought in a period known as the infamous decade, even though this period lasted more than a decade, but I digress. During this period, more people moved from the countryside into the cities, and Argentina focused on reducing foreign imports and producing more goods within the country. Argentina began the process of industrialization at this time, but it still had relatively little industry compared to many nations in Europe. Social tension mounted in the urban areas as more and more people moved into the cities and struggled to make a living. The military held significant sway over the country at this time, with the opposition forced to deal with voter fraud and political repression against anyone that spoke out too much against the government. As World War II arrived, the government decided to remain neutral. The country quickly became divided between those that supported neutrality, mainly due to a combination of Italian ancestry of many Argentinians, a historical precedent for remaining neutral in European affairs, and a distrust of the UK, and those who wanted Argentina to join the Allies, who wanted to support their trading partner America, and also tended to dislike fascism. In 1943, the government was overthrown in a military coup who established a new pro-Ally military government. This new government would eventually declare war on Germany in March 1945, but never actually fought in any battles, as the war in Europe ended just a month later. After the war, elections were scheduled to take place in 1946, and were won decisively by military general and one of the leaders of the coup, Juan Perón. Perón was probably one of the most important and influential men in Argentinian history in the 20th century, if not ever. Perón had grown popular after the coup by serving as the Minister of Labor, where he championed workers' rights. When he was arrested in late 1945 by political opponents, hundreds of thousands of people swarmed the streets demanding the release of Perón, led by his future wife, Eva Duarte. Perón's ideas on politics were so influential that he created his own ideology, known as Peronism. Now, describing Peronism is complicated. It has been described as nationalistic, populist, laborist, right-wing, 
left-wing, right-wing socialist, and third positionist, so it is a political ideology that many people can find themselves liking, or at least liking some aspect of. Braun generally advocated for greater workers' rights and progressive social security and labor laws. However, he opposed communism and wanted a corporatist state, or a state where the government would step in and work on agreements between workers and businesses. Perón wanted universal education for all Argentinians and wanted to raise up the working class, where Peronism has traditionally had the most support. Perón also favored a neutral, non-interventionist foreign policy, along with reducing foreign and particularly foreign economic interests. He expanded the military and controversially allowed many ex-Nazi war criminals into the country. Perón's wife Eva greatly helped his popularity, as she was much beloved by many in Argentina. She helped pass women's suffrage into law in 1947, helping boost Perón's support among women. However, Eva would die in 1952, and with her death, criticism of Perón would increase. Perón would win a presidential election in 1952, but quickly began to limit civil rights as more people began to protest. People were mainly upset about the economy, which had been burdened by government overexpenditure and inflation. In 1955, the military overthrew the government, forcing Perón into exile. Perón's parties and organizations were banned as Argentina entered another period period of political instability. For those keeping track, Argentina has had three coups in a period of 30 years, and the trend of more coups isn't going to stop anytime soon. In 1958, Arturo Frondizi would be elected president, and four years later he would be overthrown in a military coup for attempting to allow Peronis to re-enter the political scene. He would be succeeded by José Murillo Guido, who would serve as an interim president and put down a coup from the Navy in 1963. Arturo Umberto Ilia would be elected president in 1963, and would again, similarly to Frondizi, be overthrown in a coup after attempting to allow Peronis to re-enter politics. A military dictatorship under Juan Carlos Ongania would be set up, who would have to deal with large student protests in 1969. Within this politically tense and volatile environment, political violence began to increase. The military would regularly use brutal force to crack down on protesters and those that opposed the regime. From the Argentinian left, the Communist People's Revolutionary Army, or ERP, emerged and began a series of kidnappings, murders, and attacks on labor unions, government forces, or even just non-Marxist civilians. Peronism, which had traditionally transcended left-right barriers, began to break down without Peron. Peronism was largely split into two, with left and right Peronists willing to fight each other just as much as they would fight the government. Some left-wing Peronists formed the Monterreos, a group similar to the ERP that sought to overthrow democracy in the country and establish a socialist state. Meanwhile, those on the right formed the Argentinian Anti-Communist Alliance, or AAA, that executed and murdered those associated with left-wing or Marxist movement. Perón, who had been in exile in Spain, was surprisingly allowed to return to Argentina in 1973, the relief of the Peronist. It was hoped that Perón would return to the country and reunited, bringing some semblance of order. However, the day he landed in Argentina, a large crowd of over 3 million arrived to greet him. The right-wing Peronists began targeting left-wing Peronists, and quickly, 13 people were killed while hundreds were injured in what became known as the a Sisa massacre. Perón quickly took office, and a short reign would have a slightly improving economy and even more political violence. Perón began growing closer to the Peronist right, and the divide between the right and the left of Peronism became solidified. Perón would die in 1974, at the age of 79, from old age. He would be succeeded by his third wife, Isabel Martinez de Perón. She quickly proved to be unpopular with the general population and the military elite. In 1976, she was overthrown, and Peronism was again made illegal. Civil rights were severely restricted as Argentina entered a period known as the Ultima Junta Militar, or the last military junta. The military managed to largely end the ERP on the Monterreos terrorist actions, and it largely disbanded. The military began disappearing any who opposed the regime or who were previously associated with left-wing groups. Around 30,000 people disappeared in what became known as the Dirty War. The regime received backing from not only the AAA, but also found international support from the United States, who believed the military government in Argentina could help them fight off communism in South America. The regime was initially led by Jorge Rafael Videla, who led the military to victory against the leftists. Videla would be succeeded by General Robert Vola, who would be forced out in a military coup until, ultimately, Leopard Galtieri would take power. Galtieri would have to deal with increasing domestic pressure against the regime, as the economy worsened and the GDP fell. As the regime became more popular, he decided that in order to regain the country's favor, he would try and take the Falkland Islands. The islands had only been controlled by Argentina for a brief period in 1829 to 1831, and later in 1832 to 1833, and mostly the island were ethnically Scottish or Welsh with no ties to Argentina. However, political opinion in Argentina firmly believed that the islands were an integral part of the country, and it remains so to this day. Tensions mounted between the UK and Argentina, and in April 1982, the Falkland Islands and the neighboring Sandwich Islands were invaded by Argentina, who occupied them. In May, a British naval task force and the Argentina Navy fought in the South Atlantic Sea, with the British Navy being largely successful. The islands were retaken by British forces, and by June, Argentina had definitively lost the war. While during the war, public opinion had remained high. With the loss, the public called for an end of the junta and a return to democracy, which was brought back in 1983. 
This brings us to the current era of Argentinian history. The first three presidents after the return to democracy would all similarly work to bring those that committed war crimes during the Dirty War to justice, and would be forced out of office due to a worsening economy. One thing to note during the 80s and 90s was Peronism was still divided between right and left Peronists, with both sides vying for power, with the UCR and other smaller political parties. In 2003, left-wing Peronist Nestor Kirchner would come to power. Kirchner would leave the left Peronists to become the dominant faction of Peronism, with his new take of Peronism, known as Kirchnerism. While most Peronists tend to hold more socially conservative views, Kirchnerists embrace progressive social values and put a heavy focus on economic nationalism, and wants to prevent more foreign debt from being brought into the country. Nestor Kirchner would be president until 2007, when he would be succeeded by his wife, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner. She would largely continue his work as president, continuing left-wing economic policies, increasing relations with other left-wing governments in South America, and persecuting those that committed war crimes during the Dirty War. However, she would also have to deal with increasing corruption scandals and a hostile relationship with the media. In 2015, Marcio Macri from the conservative Republican Proposals Party would be elected president with UCR support. Macri would move the country towards more neoliberal and free market economic solutions, fighting against corruption, and moving moving Argentina towards being more friendly towards America and other right-wing or centrist governments in South America. However, a worsening economic situation led to Marcy failing to be re-elected in 2019, and Kirchnerist Alberto Fernandez coming to power. Fernandez has for the most part attempting to bring Argentina back to the Kirchnerist policies and try to reduce the spread of COVID while still keeping the economy afloat. So why does Argentina exist? Argentina is a country with a lot of political conflicts and economic troubles that don't seem to want to go away. But the country continues on and remains one of the most important players in South America economically, culturally, and politically. It isn't going to go away anytime soon, and will continue to remain an union y libertad. Next week, we will go east to the Caucasus and talk about Armenia. Prepare for ethnic violence, Christianity, ethnic genocide, mountains, and even more ethnic violence. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed. My email is whydocountriesexist at gmail.com for if you want to send your thoughts, comments, suggestions, or hate mail. I hope my pronunciations in this episode weren't too bad. Uh, shout out to Daisy Hartman for helping me with some of the Spanish, and take care. The sources used for this video are Bad and Padilla's video, What is Peronism? Geography Now's video, Argentina. Imperium's video, Argentina, The 100-Year Crisis. Jabazi's videos, uh, The Argentina War of Independence, The May Revolution, and The Cispaline Tea War. Knowledge P's video, History of Argentina. Mason Man's video, Italy's Unofficial Colonies in South America. Thotco's article, Why Argentina Accepted Nazi War Criminals After World War II. Wikipedia. World War II's video, Argentina in World War II, Out of the Trenches, Episode 12.